All right, so uh, I didn't know I was the first speaker, so. Uh, anyway, so uh, I am talking about something that is supposed to scare you. So I'm going to tell you a very scary, not a doomsday scenario, but uh, close to that. <coughs> so, uh, uh, so cybersecurity is something that I am passionate about. And I want to uh, tell you uh, what is cybersecurity is all about, what are the cyber threats, and uh, why we should care. So it all started back in 1988 when a Stanford graduate student figured out that uh, there is a way to exploit vulnerabilities in programs. And this was the time when Windows was not uh, all ubiquitous. And therefore, he uh, exploited something uh, called finger daemon in Unix. And that created the f uh, first known worm that uh, very quickly spread it through the network. Fortunately, the world was not that interconnected at that time. So therefore, uh, it did not cause too much harm, only in the academic community. But it had a lot of fingerprints that are still there in cyber attacks. So then 2001, so between 1988 and 2001, it was uh, not that bad. And then in 2001, there were subsequent uh, storms like Code Red, Nimda, and Blaster Worm. They actually uh, took the internet by storm. Uh, by then, we were quite, quite a bit interconnected. A lot of people were uh, actually connected by their desktops and, and so in some cases uh, servers and so on. So any kind of eff effect on uh, people's uh, computers as well as the internet was quite uh, problematic at, by, by 2001. Then uh, 2003, the SQL slammer. Now until then, most of the attacks were file based. So you download a file and then that file would uh, execute certain things on your machine and that might create too much traffic on the internet and this kind of stuff. So this uh, was the first worm that was not even file based. It was completely memory based. So nothing was stored on the file system or on the disk. And this basically exploited uh, SQL uh, server, Microsoft SQL server that, was, uh, that had a buffer overflow problem. And this had a huge uh, effect on the internet. So this kind of shows you know, how this uh, thing spreaded very, very quickly. And people were quite disabled by uh, this slammer worm. So then things started evolving. The attackers got uh, more and more clever. So Trojans are uh, uh, viruses or worms that stay inside your machine and then uh, will do something uh, harmful, but you wouldn't see it. So at least not immediately. So Trojans started affecting machines, and these Trojans would create a backdoor, uh, backdoor channel to a command and control center, and that started creating this idea of a botnet. So uh, the botnet era started, and these botnets are machines uh, sometimes are called zombie machines. They were recruited by infecting uh, any user's machine. It could be your machine, it could be my machine, by Trojans. And they would uh, create a backdoor towards the command, command and control center, and then they would do various things. And it started uh, because of spamming, spamming of emails. But now uh, botnets are used for various other purposes, including uh, DDoS attack or distributed denial of service attacks. So uh, here is a kind of a list. So one of the most famous one on top, you can see is a Zeus worm that was used for making a lot of money from various US banks. And the guy who was involved uh, in this, uh, his name was, his code name was Sleeker. He has not been caught even today. And in fact, he has re reappeared apparently in this uh, new hacking scenario in the US election. So, so this guy has changed his, uh, field from bank hacking to election hacking. <clears throat> so there has been various kinds of botnets. And even now, 
that uh, from 2003, 2004 time frame, now we all have smartphones. So there are uh, smartphones recruited in the botnet. Now, what happened in last October is even more scary because now we talk about IoT. You will see here about Internet of Things. Uh, your uh, various kinds of equipments at your home are connected by network. They talk to each other and they actually help you do things which you could not do before. But these devices are also are very inexpensive and therefore not very secure. So recently, uh, in October 2016, there was a huge distributed denial of service attack on the domain name system and that disabled the com uh, you know, access to internet uh, in large part of the eastern coast of US in October. And that kind of botnets, it was based on something called Mirai botnet, which was by infecting these devices with Mirai, uh, which is a, a sort of like a, a Trojan, and that uh, is now become a concern because we are talking about billions of devices being connected uh, in the space of IoT, and if that happens, then we are kind of, uh, you know, will be overwhelmed by uh, various kinds of uh, distributed denial of service. So now, <laughs> jumping to 2009, what happened in Iran? So Iranian nuclear enrichment plant was hacked, and it was hacked with something called Stuxnet. Now this Stuxnet uh, is very uh, uh, different from what we saw before because it attacked a system which was air-gapped, which means it was not connected to the internet. So which means that some social engineering went on, some uh, uh, employees of these uh, various uh, firms that are involved in this uh, Iranian nuclear uh, plant were given something, most probably an USB stick, with a copy of the worm, and if they plugged it in into their system, and then the internal network, even though it was not connected to the internet, the internal network was affected and the worm replicated itself, and what it did was it uh, slowed down the uh, centrifuges that were enriching the uranium. So it slowed down, but it did not you know, destroy them, or it did not do anything outwardly obvious, so it took them some time to even realize that they have been attacked. So it was a very clever uh, attack, which was uh, when people analyzed it, they realized that this was not done by some hobby hackers. This, this must have been done by some very powerful enemies of the country uh, that is Iran. And uh, it, was, uh, it had uh, all kinds of uh, vulnerabilities from Windows 7 to Siemens uh, uh, PLCs and so on were exploited. So, this is a little bit uh, light-hearted hearted moment here that, that uh, you know, I Iranian nuclear uh, facility is affected, but it is not, this worm was not supposed to do uh, something destructive. It is supposed to do something clandestine or what we call a, a covert attack. So I'm not, because, uh, you know, we don't have much time, I'm not going to talk about how Stuxnet worked, but you can find, if you're more interested, you can find it uh, in many uh, places on the internet. So, but Stuxnet was not the only uh, 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 case where we saw that such a industrial critical system being affected by a cyber attack. So uh, this happened before, you know, starting from 2003, actually the uh, 2003 East Coast blackout W uh, was uh, preceded by this infection in the Ohio nuclear uh, power plant with slammer worm. So we, we talked about slammer worm before. And then uh, there is a, a, a train signaling system that was attacked. There was an automobile plant whose manufacturing system was attacked and so on. So these are some of the most uh, well-known or well-publicized cases. But uh, this is not something that is very uncommon. So if you look at the data, so this is the Industrial Control System uh, Computer Emergency Response Team in the US. They are 2010 to 2015. You see that in 2010, there were 39 reported cases. In 2015, it is 295, almost 300, which means we are talking about almost a nine-fold increase in the number of incidents that happened. And if you look at the uh, kind of incidents, uh, you know, Critical manufacturing seems to be the most affected, but energy, which means uh, power transmission, power distribution, power generation, 
then uh, water, uh, water purification, water uh, supply, transportation, and uh, various uh, communication and nuclear and so on. So all these things have something in common, which is they are controlled by a supervisory control and decision uh, control uh, uh, system and data acquisition system. And uh, therefore, the focus now is on how to secure this uh, supervisory control and data acquisition system or SCADA systems. So uh, in a survey in 2015, it turns out, and this is the US, so you can imagine what's, in the, uh, what's happening in other parts of the world. So 35.6% of the companies are saying we have no strategy, uh, or, but we are developing one for you know, uh, saving ourselves from, uh, from uh, an attack. And these attacks are uh, more and more common because the convergence of information and operational technologies. So the factory floor is now connected to their business network and, and that is uh, basically the uh, uh, pathway through which these attacks happen. So uh, in the last two years, these things have be taken a very uh, national security uh, angle. So, uh, so new Israeli new, uh, electric grid was uh, attacked, but it was a surrogate grid, fortunately, so they did not suffer a blackout. But Ukraine was not that lucky. So last year and this year, Ukraine got blacked out uh, by cyber attack and, and most probably by Russians. Uh, so there were attacks on television network. There were attacks on German steel plant. Uh, there were attacks on Turkish banks. So, so all the banking network was completely jammed with a very large scale distributed denial of service attack by sending too much data on the network. Uh, the, this one I already, uh, uh, so IoT ransomware. So an Australian hotel, uh, uh, sorry, Austrian hotel was actually uh, uh, locked out uh, by using ransomware. So they could not open the doors of the visitors or uh, w whether they're in or out. So they had to pay ransom in order to get themselves unencrypted and, and get things going again. So, and we already talked about this DDoS attack by Mirai botnet using IoT devices. So now focusing on India, so uh, this is a last year survey. It turns out that financial sector is 72% uh, of the financial sector companies are saying that they have been attacked. Uh, pharmaceutical and chemical, 44% companies have been uh, at least seeing attacks, and oil and gas, 37%. But there is a saying in cybersecurity uh, uh, parlance that 100% have been attacked. The difference is whether you know it or not. So 72% are at knows that they have been attacked. Because it takes about, on an average, 260 plus days to actually figure out that you have been attacked. That has been also uh, surveyed and, and, and computed. So uh, some of the ways cyber attacks are happening in India, a large percentage of it by, is by social engineering. So, so you convince somebody that, you know, carry this thing into, the, into your uh, office or into your factory and a and, uh, and USB or something, or, you know, ask them to uh, go, go, to a, go to an email, the, uh, download an email attachment or uh, by uh, going through, uh, you know, pushing it through some messenger service and so on. And then the result is the malware infection, uh, a lot of DDoS attacks, cyber espionage, and exploitation of vulnerabilities and all that is happening. So one of the thing that we kind of, uh, the, the importance got lost because of all the, uh, all the hoopla about this uh, demonetization, just before demonetization, it was found that 3.2 million debit card information were hacked uh, from the ATM uh, uh, services supplied by Hitachi. And this are uh, the some of the banks that got uh, affected. So we, in, a, in another country, this would be a very, very big deal. But here, because of the subsequent demonetization thing, it did not get uh, that much praise or, or, or uh, uh, you know, importance. So, Recently, it was found that the hackers could easily bypass the SBI's OTP. So in any case, the SMS-based OTP is unsafe. NIST has completely prohibited in the US to use SMS-based OTP, but 
uh, in this case, it was a web-based attack by which you can actually change the OTP, I, I mean change the setting so that you don't require an OTP. So just stealing the password would have been enough. So now, uh, talking about Aadhaar and Aadhaar-based payment, it turns out that, uh, you know, if you look at the way this happens, there is a huge possibility of insider attacks. And you have seen this happening to uh, 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 Mahendra Singh, Singh Dhoni. His uh, Aadhaar was uh, actually leaked out on Twitter by the organization that was supposed to take the information from him. But that is the list, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, that is the easiest to figure out who uh, leaked it. But there are multiple stages by which an other based verification happens. And in all stages, there are huge amount of uh, possibility of insider attack. And it happened. So uh, Axis Bank uh, and its subsidiary, Suvida InfoServe, they actually did this. And they actually transferred money in the name of others by using their other information. So, so these are some of the things that are happening in India. One more thing uh, that we, we are seeing is that 60% of Android phones, and these are enterprise Android phones, not even common people's Android phone, was known to, uh, is known to be affected by a critical Qualcomm SEE vulnerability. So that basically means that all the uh, encryption that you do on, the, on your phone are vulnerable. So anybody can read your, your secret key. So that basically uh, means that uh, uh, sometimes the uh, companies, the, uh, the uh, uh, Airtels and, and Vodafones, they will push a uh, uh, update or a patch, but uh, many times we don't accept it because it consumes data. So it turns out that about 70% of phones in India use less than a uh, lollipop version of Android. And what that means is that all those uh, are vulnerable to something called a dirty cow. And we, in our lab, we have created an exploit that I can read all your SMSs and all your uh, WhatsApp messages if you have lollipop or less. So, <clears throat> so, uh, so I painted a very grim picture. So I want to tell you that there is still hope. So we recently got from the government some funding to actually set up a, a cyber security center for, for cyber security and cyber defense of critical infrastructures. And so we are going to set up India's first, the largest, uh, probably largest in Asia, the uh, critical infrastructure uh, experimental lab, which is very similar to what they have in the Idaho National Lab and Sandia National Lab in the US. So we'll be doing uh, work on this, trying to figure out how to protect ourselves. Uh, there is also, uh, uh, you know, we are trying to uh, engage as much as possible with the rest of the country. So we have uh, MOU with the Bombay Stock Exchange. We are working with Bombay Stock Exchange on uh, their cybersecurity. Uh, and RBI and SEBI both have taken cybersecurity quite seriously. And in 2016, they have given, a, given circulars to their respective uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 companies like banks and, and, and securities and exchange uh, uh, companies uh, that they have to completely overhaul their security. And in that process, we have a, a way to actually uh, engage and, and help them. Uh, we also are working with various universities that are really uh, top in the, in, the, in, the, in the world. So uh, Tel Aviv University, we signed uh, agreements. And we have signed agreements with New York University uh, for cybersecurity. So with all that, we have still hope. So I, I try to scare you, and then I'm trying to say that uh, we are working on some of these problems. But it's just not one IIT or one uh, institute can do everything. So we need these kind of centers and these kind of research programs throughout the country at various locations, and which can cooperate and build a real cyber security and cyber defense uh, posture of the country. We also started from last year, the Seesaw, the uh, which is a cybersecurity awareness week when to engage students from uh, all over India to do various kinds of cybersecurity uh, activities and competitions so that uh, there is a you know awareness as well as there is an interest so that people actually follow through uh, 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 these things in their career so we will do this again in this year so so these are some of our way of trying to uh, 
you know, uh, solved this, uh, you know, problem that we feel is very, very important and very, very urgent to actually uh, look into. <clears throat> so, but at the end, I want to also tell you that major cyber attacks will happen, right? So it's not possible to stop them. So we have to either uh, create uh, enough technology and enough methodologies to actually uh, safeguard ourselves from cyber attacks, or we have to do something called a resilient system design. So we have to design our systems resilient to cyber attack, which means even after the attack happens, we should be able to uh, detect it very, very fast. And then we have to segment part of the system. It's like, you know, amputating your, your part of your body so that you can, the rest of the body can survive. So we have to be able to do that resilience built into all our systems, financial systems, power systems, industrial manufacturing systems. So all kinds of systems have to have built-in resilience. So that's, that's a way we have to uh, solve this problem. And, and, and we have to solve this very, very urgently in a war footing, because this is something that is coming very, very fast uh, towards us. And we have already been a little bit delayed here in India. So that's all I have. <clears throat>